Today on the Tech Bytes podcast, we look at new features in Palo Alto Network's Prisma SASE and Prisma SD-WAN, including new digital experience management for home and branch users, new cloud blades, a new appliance, and enhanced AI ops capabilities. Our guest is Rohan Grove. He is Senior Director of Product Management at Palo Alto Networks. Uh, Rohan, welcome back to the podcast. So let's jump right in and talk about Autonomous Digital Experience Management, or ADEM. That's a mouthful. What is it, and how have you expanded it in this new release? Firstly, thank you for having me back. Uh, super excited to talk about these features. So starting with Autonomous Digital Experience Management, or ADEM for short. Uh, so this is a new category of product that we have introduced. And the reason this product portfolio exists is really to address the, the hybrid workforce scenario. Right? I mean, 18 months ago, most organizations were managing you know, a few dozen hundred branches. Palo Alto IT is a prime example. We had 80 branch offices. And suddenly from 80 branch offices, the IT teams had to manage branches of one, 10,000 uh -huh. users, which is 10,000 employees, of course. And we didn't have any tools, honestly. IT does not have tools to go monitor people's home offices and see if the Wi-Fi connection works well. Why is Zoom not working? So the ADEM product is essentially a deep visibility and observability tool that lets IT teams understand the user and application experience for everyone, regardless of where they're where they're working from. So whether you're working from home and you're having issues with Zoom, or you know two days a week you come back to the office and you're working from the branch, these capabilities basically allow IT to pinpoint where issues might be and then help troubleshoot them. And with Prisma SD-WAN 5.6 release, we've added ADEM capabilities into our SD-WAN appliances. We previously only had them for mobile users that are using VPN clients. We've extended that to the entire enterprise. So this means if I've got uh, users coming back to the branch and I want to get a sense of performance, I've got additional visibility into their individual performance as opposed to just you know what I would get from the SD-WAN device, which is already giving me some basic path metrics. Correct. So we um, go with beyond just path metrics. We can do hop-by-hop -hop visibility metrics. Uh, and also in the branch, you have... Uh, people other than users, right? You have things, you have IoT devices, you have camera systems. So we can actually measure performance of all of these IoT things, as well as the users that are sitting in the branch. And this is a great time to introduce the branch appliance-based ADEM because uh, like we were talking before the podcast, like I'm personally coming into the office three days a week and I'm sure a lot of people are doing the same. Okay, so you did mention there's a new appliance for the SD-WAN, that's the uh, ION 1200. And what's new about this? Yeah, so given that the branch is back in many ways, we thought this is a good time to come up with a brand new appliance, which is fully integrated with 5G. Now, 5G has been a, has been a big buzzword in the industry for a while, uh, but there's really not been a tightly integrated 5G appliance that has SD-WAN and SASE capabilities. So the mm -hmm. ION 1200 is kind of filling that gap. So it has native 5G capabilities, and for use cases like retail, um, or ATMs, kiosks that may not always have the best uh, uh, connectivity. And ATMs, by the way, are getting more and more bandwidth requirements, right? There are video ATMs that require you know, more bandwidth than before. Uh, so the 5G capable SD-WAN appliance, the ION 1200 really fills that gap. That's really interesting that uh, we've seen 5G connectivity, WAN connectivity go from a niche specialist requirement. And there were companies that built their entire uh, business around delivering 5G connectivity to companies to now it's just a built into a standard appliance from, from your SD-WAN vendor. Is there really that much demand? Is it just something that everybody wants or is it this is something that just a few customers want? So I think today it's probably three or four verticals, but these are key verticals. Um, as I said, kiosks, ATMs, and all of these are popping up all over the place. And when you have a pop-up kiosk, you're not necessarily going to have wired connectivity. And, and 4G, and honestly, leaves a lot to be desired. 5G with the promise of much higher speeds, and we're talking like reliable connectivity of 300 Mbps or more, should fill that gap. The other use case, I'd say, is the, you know, the, the big malls that have retail outlets. They don't want to be dependent on the mall operator's connectivity, and they'd like to be independent of that. And 5G gives them the capability to have primary or backup connectivity independent of the larger kind of the mall scenario. Construct yeah, that makes sense. One. Yeah, because the malls like to charge a premium for bringing the telco service in or you have to pay them a fee to have access to, to telco services. 
and this allows you, but it also allows you to do a pop-up store inside of a mall and right. require nothing. Um, the other thing that you made a point of is something that we haven't covered before is that 3G and 4G is a subset of 5G. So once you have a 5G connection, you can just, it'll downstep to whatever part of the standard. In fact, 5G is the same as 4G. It's just a few more standards banged on and then relabeled really, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's the nice part about the ION 1200 that while it'll operate at 5G, wherever it has the 5G signal, it can down select to 4G or even 3G uh, in yeah. areas where you may not have the best 5G coverage. Now, can I also do a wired connection, a, a broadband connection on this device as well, or am I just doing mobile data? No, that's a great point. So this box has uh, WAN interfaces, of course, as well. It is it is an SD WAN appliance. So we can do active active path selection on 5G and WAN interfaces. And that's a key differentiator for us, right? So uh, a lot of vendors have cellular WAN appliances, but they can't really do active active on the cellular WAN and the WAN interface. So we can do active active on both. And that gives the flexibility that uh, IT teams are looking for. Okay. Or could I use it as a backup because having that 5G running constantly could get expensive? Yeah, absolutely. So 5G is likely to be a backup uh, for, a, for a few verticals, but we absolutely think that there is potential for 5G to be the primary WAN interface. And that's going to create a whole new set of use cases, I think. And we're super excited about that possibility. And have mm -hmm. you certified any particular carriers here in the US for uh, their 5G networks? Yes. Yeah, so we're working with all the major carriers worldwide. The nice thing about the ION 1200 is that it's a single SKU that can be used anywhere in the world because we have adjusted for all the different 5G spectrums. And uh, we've been certified already uh, by AT&T, which is obviously the largest uh, service provider in the United States. And we're working on certifications with all the other usual suspects. And uh, this box is uh, going to ship at the end of the month. So we are mm. about four weeks before it's uh, available to be ordered worldwide. So by that time, we'll have a whole bunch of carrier certifications. And the interesting part about this is you can actually put the autonomous digital experience managing into this box. You can monitor the 5G connection using the ADEM features that you're now rolling into the appliances. So if you're thinking to yourself, oh, 5G doesn't work, you can actually run synthetic transactions directly from the box over the 5G to assure yourself that it's working one way or the other. Like, is it broken? Can you validate that? Or is it actually working and say, and prove that? That's an excellent point, uh, Greg. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the whole point of ADEM is to do the segment wise insight. So if there's a problem uh, with the on the carrier side, it'll actually pinpoint and say uh, the experience is bad because there's an issue with a particular hop on the carrier network, or it could be mm. something else. For me, it's just that sometimes people say to me, oh, 5G can't possibly be used for, is better, can't be better than MPLS or whatever. And in fact, we have heard from people that 5G is better than MPLS. And in some cases they said, we can't get MPLS, so 5G is better than MPLS. But in other cases, they've said 5G just performs more reliably and faster and low latency than MPLS, and that's why we just use it. And, and the tip for people who are listening is, if you want to use 5G, uh, talk to somebody who can sell you minutes by the thousands. So instead of buying one 5G SIM card and trying to find a plan, talk to a company that can aggregate it into a massive billing and you can have a thousand SIMs with you know, a million minutes a month or whatever you need to run your business. That's how you make this work. Yeah, and since you brought up the SIM things, the nice thing about the ION 1200 is that it is dual SIM enabled. So you can actually have two different SIMs from two different providers gives you the ability to to really uh, choose the best carrier for you. And uh, as oh, you oh. said, Greg, ne negotiate rates because you can kind of mix and match between <laughs> the carriers. You've got some negotiating power going on there. <laughs> well, now, what about Cloud Blades? One of the things that we've seen uh, Prisma platform, the S Prisma SD-WAN platform is, this, is the Cloud Blade platforms. So can you remind us what they are? And then let's dive into what the new releases are. So Cloud Blades is a term that we use to describe our uh, API abstraction layer, which facilitates third-party integrations. The so Cloud Blades was originally conceived by the CloudGenix team, which is now Prisma mm -hmm. SD-WAN. But we've exp we have expanded that concept and Cloud Blades as a platform on our Prisma SASE uh, solution. And mm -hmm. it's really a nice, cool way of integrating with third parties. Cloud Blades are essentially containers that have API integrations built in. So you can have a cloud blade for an AWS connectivity, or you can have a cloud blade for 
um, a chat ops connectivity. And these can be independently installed, upgraded, downgraded without impacting the main solution. I think of it right. as an application on your phone, right? You can download whatever you want, does not impact the phone's ability to make phone calls with, uh, or other things. So I can't think nice. of them as a container. Yep. You've got this SASE platform and then I can instantiate a container with these apps inside yes. that do integrations with Zoom or Microsoft Teams or ServiceNow in this case. Yeah, and those are the three new uh, integrations that we've announced as part of the SD-WAN 5.6 launch. Uh, and all of those three are super relevant applications that all of us are using, using today, right? Zoom is probably, Zoom has become a, a verb and a noun in the last 18 months. So um, yeah. no, this the, the integration with Zoom really lets IT administrators figure out based on a Zoom meeting ID, what the user experience was. So we actually integrate directly with Zoom. Zoom gives us the meeting ID and the network and QoS statistics for that meeting. We correlate okay. that with kind of what we are seeing from a networking side, from a branch side. And that really gives administrators great insights into what happened to a particular Zoom meeting, you know, good, bad, things like that. And I think that insight can be useful because if, you know, there's poor video or call quality, of course, they're going to blame the network, but you're saying you can get more insights to actually figure out what it really was. Absolutely. And you can actually uh, slice and dice that. Like, was it bad audio quality or was it bad video quality or both? So it's in, it's it's amazing like the power of APIs and and how this uh, exchange of APIs can can tie both of these things together collaboration and and branch networking and that can be useful because Zoom is becoming an essential business tool but for a lot of IT shops it's also kind of a black box you just get the service and you get what you get correct absolutely I'd be I'd be interested to understand how Adem you know this this digital experience mentoring and this CloudBlade works together because this is one is actually pulling stats, if I understand this right, directly from the Zoom call itself and saying, I can see that Zoom is telling me that this call is going well or bad or, you know, whatever. But at the same time, I've got the digital experience management tool, which is much more general purpose. But so there must be a separation there. There must be a difference between the two. Or is it too much information almost? Um, no, I think they're approaching it in different ways, right? So uh, the Zoom cloud blade depends on the actual real Zoom calls and Zoom traffic that was going on and it's providing you information on on kind of the past, right? What yeah. happened on the call, you know, what was good, what was bad. The ADEM, uh, when you configure ADEM to monitor Zoom, it's actually sending synthetic traffic and it's potentially trying to predict the future that, hey, uh, I'm sending synthetic traffic to the Zoom application and it seems like things will look good, right? And that gives you an indication like, yeah, this today, this morning, uh, Zoom will behave well because I've run synthetic traffic from all my branches, from all my users, and it seems to be working fine. Right? So they're looking at it in different mm. views of, you know, predicting what could happen in the future and then analyzing what happened in the past, depending on what you're yeah. using. Okay, I get that. So if I'm operational and I'm on the help desk, I get a report from somebody, I might look at, I might look at the, the ADEM experience for the whole network. So the Prisma ADEM tool tells me, ah, this is the experience from the device. But I guess I could also look at the experience from the user edge device, so the laptop or the phone, which also right. has the, the agent on installed. And then I could also, if I knew that there was something specific with Zoom, which doesn't necessarily run on the same infrastructure, or if you want to get to be able to point the finger a little bit more accurately and do root cause, then you're now able to say, well, like the Zoom call was a problem and I can put all of that together. You can, and you know the flow metrics that we collect on the SD-WAN appliance can actually point out that, hey, uh, this is an issue with Zoom and this is not a network issue. And we can send all those logs uh, to your Zoom uh, vendor and tell them, you know, you got to solve this. So where does that lead into AI ops? Because we're seeing a lot of push around um, automating a lot of this. Now that we've actually got all this data, in a weird kind of a way, we're making another problem about how do we handle it? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, totally, completely agree. Um, AI ops, so it's ex it's exactly what you said, right? Like sometimes we have too much data, right? There's too many things happening. There's too many alerts, too many systems that are trying to you know, tell the user something is wrong. And then it just leads to alert fatigue. And the, yeah. and the IT admin has no clue what's a real alert and what's a real issue. It's, it's never been an issue about not having alerts. It's always been too many alerts. So AI mm -hmm. ops kind of evolved from, Hey, can we filter out the noise? Can we really look at everything that's going on, start doing correlation? So 
the first thing you need to correlate the alerts. Like, are these 10 alerts actually pointing me to the same problem? And then is alert A correlated to alert B? Once you figure that out, then you need to find out causation. Was alert A caused by alert B or was alert B caused by alert A? Those are very mm. complicated things to do. Like that's where machine learning and artificial intelligence comes in. And the system has to figure this out over time. And we've been dabbling in AI ops um, for a couple of years now. We had our first release of AI ops about a year ago. We're continuously innovating. Like this is not a one release mm. thing, right? Um, right? AI by definition is a, in a supervised uh, learning capability. And the more the system learns, the more it actually figures out that, okay, I've seen this alert before. It was caused by X problem and this looks similar to that. So you look at all these sequences, you look at the patterns, and then you can recognize the patterns. So a, a lot of our audience is probably going to roll their eyes when they hear about AI ops and ML. Like, yeah, yeah, everybody's talking about that. But you're, uh, it sounds like you're taking care to introduce it slowly to let people get comfortable with it, to actually validate it themselves that it's actually delivering value to them as opposed to just some marketing language. Yeah, and because we have you know many, many customers, our, our product is a SaaS product. We roll out these capabilities uh, in our cloud. And you know once we have... A release like 5.6 was rolled out last week, customers who logged in on Monday, last Monday, automatically see all these new capabilities, right? They don't have to do anything on their SD1 appliances, no firmware upgrade required, nothing required. They just inherit these capabilities because it's delivered from the cloud. And because of this, you know, they can start looking at these new AI ops things and see, hey, if the system is telling me some interesting things. And over time, they can start adopting this. And because we are looking at, you know, hundreds of thousands of branches across the world, uh, we can literally start correlating and say, this is specific to this vertical for finance, or this particular alerts may be specific to the retail vertical and start giving customized suggestions to users uh, on, on vertical basis as well. Well, that does wrap up our time. Uh, Rohan, thanks for joining us. If folks want to learn more, where would you send them? Okay, so firstly, I just want to say that uh, we are really happy that Gartner picked Prisma SD-WAN as a leading vendor in their magic quadrant. But Prisma SD-WAN is just one part of our bigger Prisma SASE solution, right? And we have tightly integrated Prisma SD-WAN with our Prisma Access Cloud Security solution. We had the industry's first SASE conference a couple of days ago, and I would very much encourage folks to go check out SASE Converge. You can view the, the awesome um, recordings at your own time and really get a holistic view, not just of Prisma SD-WAN, but of the larger Prisma SASE solution and really appreciate uh, having me on the podcast today. All right, so that's sassyconverge.paloaltonetworks.com. If you want to go look at it for yourself, we'll also have that link in the show notes, sassyconverge.paloaltonetworks.com. Uh, thanks, Rohan, for joining us. Thanks to Palo Alto Networks for being a sponsor. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are many more fine, free technical podcasts and our community blog. It's all at packetpushers.net. You can follow us on Twitter at Packet Pushers. Find us on LinkedIn and rate us on Apple Podcasts. And last but not least, remember that too much networking would never be enough. <laughs>